Hi, and thanks for joining Now TV and Bedtime Stories. I know I didn't record um, a segment yesterday, and maybe was it the day before? Been um, busy doing stuff. Uh, but I'll try and get as many days in a row as possible. You know, but the book will get read. Just, you know, it'll get read when it gets read. Um, I took the cover off. You know, the omen, not wanting to have the whole thing rip apart. So you just see the book. Alright, without further ado, here we go. At last, when you had all formed your inevitable and totally erroneous conclusions, you departed for the hotel, and I was left alone. I had imagined that I had reached the end of my adventures, but a very unexpected occurrence showed me that there were surprises still in store for me. A huge rock falling from above boomed past me, struck the path, and bounded over into the chasm. For an instant, I thought that it was an accident, but a moment later, looking up, I saw a man's head against the darkening sky, and another stone struck the very ledge upon which I was stretched within a foot of my head. Of course, the meaning of this was obvious. Moriarty had not been alone. A confederate, and even that one glance had told me how dangerous a man that confederate was, had kept guard while the professor had attacked me. From a distance unseen by me, he had been a witness of his friend's death and of my escape. He had waited, and then, making his way round to the top of the cliff, he had endeavoured to succeed where his comrade had failed. I did not take long to think about it, Watson. Again I saw that grim face look over the cliff, and I know that it was a precursor of another stone. I scrambled down on the path. I don't think I could have done it in cold blood. It was a hundred times more difficult than getting up. But I had no time to think of the danger. For another stone sang past me. As I hung by my hands from the edge of the ledge, halfway down I slipped. But, by the blessing of God, I landed torn and bleeding upon the path. I took to my heels, did ten times, ten miles over the mountains in the darkness, and a week later I found myself in Florence, with the certainty that no one in the world knew what had become of me. I had only one confidant, my brother, Mycroft. I owe you many apologies, dear Watson. But it was all important that it should be thought I was dead. And it is quite certain that you would not even have written so convincing an account of my unhappy end had you not yourself thought that it was true. Several times during the last three years I have taken up my pen to write to you, but always I feared lest your affectionate regard for me should tempt you to some indiscretion which would betray my secret. For that reason I turned away from you this evening when you upset my books. For I was in danger at the time, and any show of surprise and emotion upon your part might have drawn attention to my identity and led to the most deplorable and irreparable, irreparable results. As to Mycroft, I had to confide in him in order to obtain the money which I needed. The course of events in London did not run so well as I had hoped, for the trial of the Moriarty gang left two of its most dangerous members, my own most vindictive enemies, at liberty. I travelled for two years in Tibet, therefore, and amused myself by visiting Lhasa and spending some days with the head lama. You may have read of the remarkable explorations of Norwegian named Sidrisen, but I am sure that it never occurred to you that you were receiving news of your friend. I then passed through Persia, looked in at Mecca, and paid a short but interesting visit to the Khalifa at Khartoum the results of which I have communicated to the Foreign Office returning to France. I spent some months in a research into the coal tar derivatives, which I conducted in a laboratory at Montpellier in the south of France. Having concluded this to my satisfaction, and learning that only one of my enemies was now left in London, I was about to return when my movements were hastened by the news of this very remarkable Park Lane mystery, which not only appealed to me by its own merits, but which seemed to offer some most peculiar personal opportunities. I came over at once to London, called in my own person at Baker Street through Mrs. Hudson into violent hysterics, and found that Mycroft had preserved my rooms 
and my paper exactly as they had always been. So it was, my dear Watson, that at two o'clock today I found myself in my old armchair in my own old room, and only wishing that I had seen my old friend Watson in the other chair, which she has so often adorned. Such was the remarkable narrative to which I listened on that April evening, a narrative which would have been utterly incredible to me had it not been confirmed by the actual sight of the tall, spare figure and the keen, eager face, to which I had never thought to see again. In some manner he had learned of my own sad bereavement, and his sympathy was shown in his manner rather than in his words. Work is the best antidote to sorrow, my dear Watson, said he, and I have a piece of work for us both tonight, which, if we can bring it to a successful conclusion, will in itself justify man's life on this planet. In vain I begged him to tell me more. You will hear and see enough before morning, he answered. We have three years of the past to discuss. Let that suffice until half-past nine, when we start upon the notable adventure of the empty house. It was indeed like old times when at that hour I found myself seated beside him in a hansom, my revolver in my pocket and the thrill of adventure in my heart. Holmes was cold and stern and silent. As the gleam of the street lamps flashed upon his austere features, I saw that his brows were drawn down in thought and his thin lips compressed. I knew not what wild beast we were about to hunt down in the dark jungle of criminal London, but I was well assured for the bearing of this master huntsman that the adventure was a most grieve, grave one, while the sardonic smile which occasionally broke through his aesthetic gloom boded little good for the object of our quest. I had imagined that we were bound for Baker Street, but Holmes stopped the cab at the corner of Cavendish Square. I observed that as he stepped out, he gave a most searching glance to right and left, and at every subsequent street corner he took the utmost pains to assure that he was not followed. Our route was certainly a singular one. Holmes' knowledge of the byways of London was extraordinary, and on this occasion he passed rapidly and with an assured step through a network of mews and stables, the very existence of which I had never known. We emerged at last into a small road lined with old gloomy houses which led us into Manchester Street, and so to Blandford Street. Here he turned swiftly down a narrow passage, passed through a wooden gate into a deserted yard, and then opened with a key the back door of a house. We entered together, and he closed it beneath, behind us. The place was pitch dark, but it was evident to me that it was an empty house. Our feet creaked and crackled over the bare planking, and my outstretched hand touched a wall from which the paper was hanging in ribbons. Holmes' cold, thin fingers closed round my wrist and led me forward down a long hall until I dimly saw the murky fanlight over the door. Here Holmes turned suddenly to the right, and we found ourselves in a large, square, empty room, heavily shadowed in corners, but faintly lit in the center from the lights of the street beyond. There was no lamp, but faintly, whoops, but near, and the window was thick with dust, so that we could only just discern each other's figures within. My companion put his hand upon my shoulder and his lips closer to my ear. Do you know where we are? he whispered. Surely that is Baker Street, I answered, staring through the dim window. Exactly. We are in Camden House, which stands opposite to our own old quarters. But why are we here? Because it commands so excellent a view of the picturesque pile. Might I trouble you, my dear Watson, to draw a little nearer to the window, taking every precaution not to show yourself, and then to look up at our old rooms, the starting point of so many of your little fairy tales? We will see if my three years of absence have entirely taken away my power to surprise you. I crept forward and looked across the familiar window as my eyes fell upon it. I gave a gasp and a cry of amazement. The blind was down and a strong light was burning in the room. The shadow of a man who was seated in a chair within was thrown in hard black outline upon the luminous screen of the window. There was no mistaking the poise of the head, the squareness of the shoulders, the sharpness of the features. The face was turned half round, and the effect was that of one of those black silhouettes which our grandparents loved to frame. It was a perfect reproduction of Holmes. So amazed was I that I threw up my hand to make sure that the man himself was standing beside me. He was quivering with silent laughter. 
Well, said he, good heavens, I cried, it is marvelous. I trust that age doth not wither, nor custom stale my infinite variety, said he, and I recognize in his voice the joy and pride which the artist takes in his own creation. He really is rather like me, is it not? I should be prepared to swear that it was you. The credit of the execution is due to Monsieur Oscar Manure of Grenoble, who spent some days in doing the molding. It is a bust in wax. The rest I arranged myself during my visit to Baker Street this afternoon. But why? Because, my dear Watson, I had the strongest possible reason for wishing certain people to think that I was there when I was really elsewhere. And you thought the room was watched? I knew that they were watched. By whom? By my old enemies, Watson. By the charming society whose leader lies in the... The Riken back fall. You must remember that they knew, and only they knew, that I was still alive. Sooner or later they believed that I should come back to my rooms. They watched them continuously, and this morning they saw me arrive. How do you know? Because I recognized their sentinel when I glanced out my window. He is a harmless enough fellow, Parker by name, a garretor by trade, and remarkable performer upon the Jew's hop. I cared nothing for him, but I cared a great deal for the much more formidable person who was behind him, the bosom friend of Moriarty, the man who dropped the rocks over the cliff, the most cunning and dangerous criminal in London. That is the man who is after me tonight, Watson, and that is the man who is quite unaware that we are after him. My friend's plans were gradually reveling themselves, revealing themselves. From this convenient retreat, the watchers were being watched and the trackers tracked. That angular shadow up yonder was the bait, and we were the hunters. In silence, we stood together in the darkness and watched the hurrying figures who passed and repassed in front of us. Holmes was silent and motionless, but I could tell that he was keenly alert, that his eyes were fixed intently upon the stream of passers-by. It was a bleak and boisterous night, and the wind whistled shrilly down the long street. Many people were moving to and fro, most of them muffled in their coats and cravats. Once or twice it seemed to me that I had seen the same figure before, and I especially noticed two men who appeared to be sheltering themselves from the wind in the doorway of a house some distance up the street. I tried to draw my companion's attention to them, but he gave a little ejaculation of impatience, and continued to stare into the street. More than once he fidgeted with his feet and tapped rapidly with his fingers upon the wall. It was evident to me that he was becoming uneasy, that his plans were not working out altogether as he had hoped. At last, as midnight approached and the street casually cleared, he paced up and down the room in uncontrollable, uncontrollable agitation. I was about to make some remark to him when I raised my eyes to the lighted window and again experienced almost as great a surprise as before. I clutched Holmes arm and pointed upward. The shadow has moved, I cried. It was indeed no longer the profile but the back which was turned towards us. Three years had certainly not smoothed the asperities of his temper or his impatience with a less active intelligence than his own. Of course it has moved, said he. Am I such a farcical bungler, Watson, that I should erect an obvious dummy and expect that some of the sharpest men in Europe would be deceived by it. We have been in this room two hours, and Mrs. Hudson has made some change in that figure eight times, or once in every quarter of an hour. She works it from the front so that her shadow may never be seen. Ah, he drew in his breath with a shrill excited intake. In the dim light I saw his head thrown forward, his whole attitude rigid with attention. Outside the street was absolutely deserted. Those two men might still be crouching in the doorway, but I could no longer see them. All was still and dark, save only the brilliant yellow screen in front of us with the black figure outlined upon its center. Again, in the outer silence, I heard that thin, Sibilant note which spoke of intense suppressed excitement. An instant later he pulled me back into the blackest corner of the room, and I left his warning hand upon my lips. The fingers which clutched me were quivering. Never had I known my friend more moved, and yet the dark street still stretched lonely and motionless before us.
but suddenly I was aware of that which his keener senses had already distinguished. A low, stealthy sound came to my ears, not from the direction of Baker Street, but from the back of the very house in which we lay concealed. A door opened and shut. An instant later, steps crept down the passage steps, which were meant to be silent, but which reverberated harshly through the empty house. Holmes crouched back against the wall, and I did the same, my hand closing upon the handle of my revolver. Peering through the gloom, I saw the vague outline of a man, a shade blacker than the blackness of the open door. He stood for an instant, and then he crept forward, crouching, menacing into the room. He was within three yards of us, the sinister figure, and I had braced myself to meet his spring before I realized that he had no idea of our presence. He passed close beside us, stole over the window, and very softly and noiselessly raised it for half a foot. As he sank to the level of this opening, the light of the street, no longer dimmed by the dusty glass, fell full upon his face. The man seemed to be beside himself with excitement. His two eyes shone like stars, and his features were working convulsively. He was an elderly man, with a thin projecting nose, a high bald forehead, and a huge grizzled moustache. An opera hat was pushed to the back of his head, and an evening dress, short front, gleamed out through his open overcoat. His face was gaunt and swarthy, scored with deep, savage lines. In his hand he carried what appeared to be a stick, but as he laid it down upon the floor it gave a metallic clang. Then from the pocket of his overcoat he drew a bulky object, and he busied himself in some task which ended with a loud, sharp click as if a spring or bolt had fallen into its place. Still kneeling upon the floor, he bent forward and threw all his weight and strength upon some lever, with the result that there came a long, whirling, grinding noise, ending once more in a powerful click. He straightened himself then, and I saw that what he held in his hand was a sort of gun, with a curiously misshapen butt. He opened it at the breech, put something in, and snapped the breech lock. Then, crouching down, he rested the end of the barrel upon the ledge of the open window, and I saw his long moustache droop over the stalk, and his eye gleam as it peered along the sights. I heard a little sigh of satisfaction as he cuddled the butt into his shoulder, and saw that amazing target, the black man on the yellow ground, standing clear at the end of his foresight. For an instant he was rigid and motionless, then his finger tightened on the trigger, there was a strange loud whiz and a long, silvery tinkle of broken glass. At that instant, Holmes sprang like a tiger, like a tiger, huh, onto the marksman's back and hurled him flat upon his face. He was up again in a moment, and with convulsive strength he seized Holmes by the throat. But I struck him on the head with the butt of my revolver, and he dropped again upon the floor. I fell upon him, and as I held my comrade, blew a shrill call upon a whistle. There was the clatter of running feet upon the pavement, and two policemen in uniform with one plain closed detective rushed through the front entrance and into the room. That you, Lestrade? said Holmes. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I took the job myself. It's good to see you back in London, sir. I think you want a little unofficial help. Three undetected murderers and one year won't do, Lestrade, but you handled the Mosey mystery with less than your usual. That's to say, you handled it fairly well. We had all risen to our feet, our prisoner breathing hard with a stalwart constable on each side of him. Already a few loiterers had begun to collect in the street. Holmes stepped up to the window, closed it, and dropped the blinds Lestrade had produced two candles, and the policemen had uncovered their lanterns. I was able at last to have a good look at our prison prisoner. It was a tremendously viral and yet sinister face which was turned towards us, with a bowed philosopher above the jaw of a sensualist below. The man must have started with a great capacities for good or for evil, but one could not look upon his cruel blue eyes with their drooping cynical lids or upon the fierce aggressive nose and the threatening deep-lined brow without reading nature's plainest danger signals. He took no heed of any of us, but his eyes were fixed upon Holmes' face with an expression in which hatred and amazement were equally blended. You fiend, he kept on muttering, you clever, clever fiend.
Thanks for listening. I gave you double time tonight to make up for the lost days. I'll do that, respectively, as I have the time to. Come back for more. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.